So this is a session about um, organizations, organization best practices, and how Capital One has, um, uh, the, uses ca uh, organizations to manage all their AWS accounts. Um, my name is Andrew Samuelson. I work as a principal in the um, AWS team. Uh, we're going to be joined later on by Christopher Schultz, who's a, a development um, a director of the software development um, at Capital One. He sits down here, so he'll come and join us later on. So. How many in the room knows what organization says? I hope I see all the hands. No, all that stuff. OK, that's cool. We'll get there. Agenda for the day. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of AWS organizations to make sure that everybody's on the same page, knows what it is. Um, you guys can come in. There's seats up in front. Talk about what organizations is at a very high level, so we get just everybody's on the same page of what, what you can do with organizations. Um, then I'm going to walk through the best practices, at least things to think about when you're using organizations or if you're going to planning on deploying organizations. And then we'll have Chris come up and talk about um, Capital One um, and how they're using organizations um, to manage all of the accounts that they have in their environment. So, what is organizations? Organization is a service we launched to reInvent last year. Uh, it's about managing a lot of AWS accounts. Um, you can use it to manage two accounts. You can use it to manage a couple of thousand accounts. It spans the gamut. And the whole idea being is that you can do it centrally. Um, big benefit out of it is that, well, central management. You can also create accounts. So we've created, we put, added an API in organizations to allow you to programmatically create accounts. Um, allowing you to create a workflow for creating accounts, essentially almost building an account factory for creating an account, configuring, and then handing it over to whoever needs an account for their purpose. Um, you can logically group accounts. So organizations create something called an organization, the outer umbrella under which all your accounts live. In that organization, you can go and organize your accounts into logical units. We call them organizational units. So organization, organizational units is a smaller grouping. And we give you those, this capability more from a management convenience. It's almost like if you think about in, in the identity space where you have users and groups. And when you put, want to put the same permissions on a set of users, you create a group, you put the users in the group, and you put the permissions on the group. Same concept here. You have a group. You put accounts together in that group that have similar um, uh, functionality or that you want to apply the same policies to. And now you put the policies on the OU, and they will affect the account. That's what the OU is. And as I talked about organizational policies, um, one thing that I didn't mention here, this is the middle one. I held off on that a little bit. Goal is to get a lot of AWS services to integrate with organizations. Every single service that exists are eventually going to be on organization. That's the goal. That's the vision. This is where we're heading. So that you can have various policies to go in and control various aspects of your environment. Today, there's only one. It's something called a service control policy that allows you to control which service API, so it's down to the API level, like EC2 run instance or S3 create bucket, to define which APIs in an account is accessible to the users in the account. And it doesn't matter what permission the user in the account has, they can never override that policy that you define. And you can put it in different places in your hierarchy. You can put it at the top of your hierarchy or you can put it at the bottom of your hierarchy on the individual accounts. The higher up you put it, the wider the blast radius. The more accounts you actually can go and configure and manage in that way. Another big feature, big benefit out of this is you can have one account that pays for a lot of other accounts. If you have standalone accounts, you have to have a payment method for each account. You get a bill for each account, and you have to pay for each account. With, cons with consolidated billings, the feature that's integrated into organizations, you have one account that is the payer and pays for all the other accounts regardless of how many they are. The big features, create account, logically group accounts, apply policies, and also go in and get the consolidated billing. All of those are the big features in organizations. So best practices. We're going to walk through all of these in separate slides. But basically, plan, secure, control, manage, automate, audit, pick one, and keep it simple. Right. Plan. And this is probably the one of the more important ones that I'm, and this is probably one that I'm going to spend most of the time on, just to be a little bit of a heads up. Key thing, if you want to go down the path of multi-account story, is to plan. Plan ahead, because you're going to benefit it for it later on. If you just go in and start creating accounts, because it's easy to do it, and you don't think through what you're doing, 
you're going to have to think, do some uh, catching up later on and trying to go in and adjust it according to what you really want to do. Key thing is figure out why you need an account. Right? Have a strategy for it. Do you need an account per developer? Or is it that you need an account per project? Is it account per, pro per uh, product? Is it account per team? Everybody has different requirements and depending on what they want to, what they want to accomplish. The key to understand is an account is very special, right? An account is a resource container with a hard boundary. There's a isolation boundary around it uh, for security reasons. So if you create a, a re this resource container of the account, you put resources in it, you can't move it to another account. So you gotta think about why am I creating the account? What is the purpose of that account? What am I gonna do with that account? Um, et cetera. Now what we've seen is what we've seen a lot of customers do, they go and create like three different accounts for their product or project. There's a dev account, there's a non-prod account, and there's a production account. That's one strategy. I'm not saying that fits you, but it's one way of thinking of this is how I want to do it. I want to have an account that's developer that is a little bit loose, more loose with regards to what can be done. Once that's done, I'll move the code over to the non-prod. Now I test to see what actually is going to happen, and later on I move it into prod. And the further down the stack I move it, the more careful I am, the more secure the account is, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And this is where you can use organizational units as well. Once you define what you want to use an account for, now you can start looking about com around for commonalities and think through like, well, I'm going to have more than one production account. Maybe I have five production accounts. And all of them have the same characteristics. I don't want anybody to use Redshift, or maybe I don't want anybody to use SQS, making up examples here. You can group them now in an OU and manage them centrally with a, with a service control policy. Right? So now you have a management convenience. You can group them. Another benefit that I haven't talked to yet but the reason for the strategy, which is a good one as well, is that you can always call in to the organization's API and ask me, tell me, give me a list of all the accounts that are in my organization. Or give me a list of all the accounts that are in my production OU. Or give me a list of all the accounts that are in my European OU. Maybe that's how I group my accounts. And you can always get that list back. There's nothing you have to maintain separately in a spreadsheet or any of that kind of mechanisms. You can always get this information back static, uh, instantaneously by calling the API or using the console or using the CLI. Right. You can build a hierarchy. And this is also where to think through how do things fit together. Um, you can have OUs and OUs, which means you're starting to nest it. You're starting to go down a layer. So you could imagine having, a, 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 if I keep, stay with the production environment, I might have a production OU. And in the production OU, you have application one OU, and application two OU, and application three OU. And in there, I have the separate accounts. Now, I've built a layer of, I have root at, the, root at the top, the start of the hierarchy. I have a production OU. I have three OUs underneath it, and then I have the accounts under that. I now have a, whatever, one, two, three, four layer deep hierarchy. And the policies you define and want to enforce, you can put them anywhere you want. So if you want to have one policy that you know this is all way needs to be enforced for all my production account, you can put them on the production OU. And if you have different ones, you can put them on the individual OUs that you have underneath that OU. Right. So key, think through what you're going to do with your accounts. Why do you need accounts? We've made it very easy to create accounts, but think through what you're going to do before you start running off and creating a lot of accounts. Secondly, think through how you can group them. Use the knowledge, think about what it is, what are you trying to accomplish? Is it dev, test, and prod? That's a lot of, a lot of customers are going down this path. What I've seen other customers do is also doing them geographically because there are different requirements and different geographies for what needs to be enforced. Right. Secure. Okay, I got my organization, I created it all in place, nice and dandy. What do I do now? Secure your lock, lock down your master account. In other words, there's a one account that's special in an organization. It's called the master account. Um, it's also the, also the payer account for all your accounts. Make sure to lock it down as much as you can, right? And I know there are customers that very, some have created an organization from scratch, will create them from scratch. Some will have legacy with things they've been running for years. These are best, best practices and guidance that we believe you should do. The first one, make sure you have MFA on route. This is not really an IM, uh, an organization, it's more of a, an IM best practice, but it is very uh, prudent to also have it in organizations, even more important to remember that master account is very, very powerful. 
It's an account that allows you to manage all the other accounts that you have. So you want to lock down root and make sure that nobody uses root. It is very powerful permissions on root. Identify who actually needs access to the account. And identify what kind of access do they need. Why? You want to have least privilege. You want to make sure that the people that have access only have the right to do what's necessary. Right? If, there's some, if the CFO and his team wants access to the bell because that's what they use, that's what they look at, and they need access to the master account, you can give them access, but only give them access to the billing pages, only give them access to the bill. There is no need to do a star-star policy or give them access to organizations. If the only thing my job is in the account is to help create accounts, only give me the create account API. Don't give me anything else in organizations. Remember, extremely powerful tool that sits in the center of all the accounts that you have. So you want to go and limit what they do. Another recommendation I have is put MFA basically on anybody that has access into the account that has, uh, gets access to any kind of mutating API, um, anybody who can change anything. It's always a good uh, security posture to think through those and make sure that you have that extra security uh, measure in place. Um, you can use also IAM policies to go in and control which parts of an organization an a principal can manage. Right? And, Excuse me, an OU, an account, a policy, secure, a secure, a service control policy, all three of them are resources that are managed by the organization, which means they have an ARN, which means you can now create a policy that says this user can go and manage this piece in the organization. Example, Anders can manage the OU production and he can put SCPs on production, but he can't do anything else. He can't call create account. Uh, he can't move accounts, but he can control the SCPs specifically on production, right? Narrow it down, scope down what individuals can do and make control of what, it, what, what the pieces are, what they can do. Make sure to turn on CloudTrail. This should be a no-brainer. This is something you should do in any account that you have as a way of getting an audit trail of events that take, out, take effect in the account. But I'll talk to that in a little bit later on as well, but make sure that audit trail gets written to a specific account. Don't use the master account as the, where you have the bucket for the audit trail. Write it off elsewhere for the security people in your organization to get access to so they have access to the audit trails. It's just normal security posture, normal security best practice. The last bullet up there says don't create resources. This is more of a Try to avoid, uh, if any, if for any reason, to create resources in the master account. Don't spin up EC2 instances unless it is absolutely necessary. Don't create a Dynamo table, whatever it is, right? This is the hub for you to manage the other accounts. That's the intent of the master account. Now, if you happen to have resources in there and there's a need for you to put resources in there, you can do so. But once again, make sure that whoever needs access to those, it's locked down so they only get access to those pieces. If they need access to manage EC2, only give them EC2 access. But if you can't avoid it, try to not have resources in the master account, um, just for that reason of minimizing the set of people that have access. And the reason I'm harping on this whole deal of try to make sure that they have the right access is that you want to minimize any kind of chance that somebody by mistake does something that they weren't aware of what the impact is. Um, given that you now can go and impact more than one account, you want to keep that under control so there's a smaller set of people that can do it. Um, it is always easier also, if you tighten up as much as possible, it's always easier to relax and sort of tighten up later on. So rather you tighten up a little bit too much and then potentially later on you're going, in, you're going to in, ease it up so it's easier to get access to pieces. So lockdown. Now in relation to that also, I put control in here. So fine, we've got my organization, I've set it all up nice and dandy, I've got my hierarchy, I've locked down my master account, now what? Now you're gonna start taking advantage of all the goodies that are in there. Is that for, for now, there is one piece, there's a service control policy, um, but you might have your own mechanisms for rolling out things into account. Um, this is where you should uh, take careful steps, especially with a service control policy, and think through how you deploy them, right? Try them out. Um, it's almost like you do a development, you do a stage deployment. You try it with one server, and if that works fine, you try it with two servers, and that works fine, you can go a little bit more, and you can go a little bit more. And any time you hit a snag, you roll back, right? Same thing here, same principle applies. Try it out. You might want to create your own little test OU that you have maybe two or three accounts in. And I know it's not easy, you can't really mimic what you have with regards to what a production environment looks like, 
but at least you have a starting point to test it so you can see what the effect is, actually what the impact is. So whenever you create a policy, try it out on that OU, or if you want to try an individual account, that's fine as well, but minimize the set of accounts you're trying it out on before you roll it out further to any other accounts. Right? Once you've put the service security control policy, and this is specifically for that policy for now, um, you can log into that account with appropriate credentials, and you can open up the uh, uh, policy simulator. How many knows about the policy simulator? Hands up. No, good. So the policy simulator is a tool in the IAM arsenal where you can go and look at what's the impact. What's the impact? What is this user going to be able to do? And we actually have updated the policy simulator. We did that when we launched the organization so that it is aware of service control policies. So in this case, if you put a service control policy on, a, on an account, have a test principle in that account, look at that principle to see what the impact is through the policy simulator. You get a, you get a view of like, well, okay, this is what's happening. Oh, I didn't intend that API to be blocked. And then you have to go back and fix your policy. It's a good posture to do that prior to actually going in and, and starting rolling it out widely. So, uh, Benefits, you catch errors earlier. Uh, as I said, this is normally what you do also when you do software development, where you go from development stage all the way up to production. You try it out bits for bits. Uh, it also helps minimize blast radius and, and do things in effect. So keep in mind, roll out changes, manage how you roll out the changes, do it in stages, and, and, and checkpoints wherever you are with the pieces that you're working on. Manage. So one of the things that have come up, we've talked about now rolling out. One uh, thing we've observed, and I thought I'd bring it up as a best practice, is um, talked about in the beginning about, think about what you want to do with an account. You should also think about what the life cycle of the account is. Is this an account that I'm going to be using for a long, long time? Is it something that I'm going to be um, um, doing other pieces with? Um, has something happened with the account that means I quickly need to shut it down uh, because there's some weird stuff going on in it that I have no idea what it is? Um, you can build an infrastructure around this as well. And so this is also where OUs come in as a very handy tool, um, have pieces in place. So you can create an OU, something we sometimes recommend, like create an OU, you call suspended or give it a different name if you wanted to. And the trick here is you put an empty policy on it. Basically, it's empty, has nothing in it. Um, or if you want to do it in a different way, you could put a policy that says deny all. Same effect, there's no difference in effect with the service control policy. And whenever you notice there's an account that might be acting weird or there's some weird behavior in it, you can move that account through a simple click or just do the CLI from whatever it is into the suspended OU. That means you're effectively shutting down any access to any API in that account. Now, resources are still there and the resources are never touched. Any instances that are up and running are still continue to run, but any access to any AWS service APIs are effectively blocked. So now you've locked it down. Now, the tricky part here is, what do I want to do with that? So you might want to look at if it's a full deny policy of there's certain smaller pieces that you want to keep open because you want to go in and look at what actually is going on. Maybe you want to use an IAM user to go look at the cloud trail, or maybe you want to go in and look at some other pieces of it. Maybe there's only a read-only policy that gets created. But it's a way of putting an account into a state where you have, um, you take away the access for certain things because you're, you're suspicious to it. Another option that we suggest is also having potentially a separate OU, you might call closed or um, non-used accounts, where you put accounts that you don't want to use anymore. You realize, end of life of project, what do I do with this account now? I don't want to have it sitting there, I don't want somebody by accident to start spinning things up in it. Best practice is you go in, you clean out the account, you delete the resources, um, and then you move the account into, you click the button that says close the account, it gets closed and you can move it into that, the OU that I talked about. That gives you a list of all the accounts. You now have all the accounts still there that you've had previously, so you have the historical information, and all of a sudden, nobody can do anything in that account at that point, right? So there's another way of managing your accounts. And really, we're thinking about what is the life cycle? This is an account that I'm gonna use forever. It gets back to the whole notion of, why am I creating an account? Is it for a team? Is it for a user? Is it for a project? Is it for a division? What is that account gonna be used for? And part of that, think through the life cycle of it as well. Is there part of it, there's a start, a create it, there's a configuration piece, then it's gonna be a long stage when I'm actually gonna be using the account. What happens at the end? What do I wanna do with it in the end? And what if something happens that I wanna shut down? So. Automate. 
So one of the things we've, uh, that I usually recommend, and this is another way of minimizing the amount of people that actually have access into the master account, um, try to automate as much as possible. And I said that's possible. You, you have to figure out what is a good posture for you to automate. Um, a good example of what can be automated is um, account creation and account configuration. And we've seen a lot of customers, they actually build a workflow and it's, all the bits and pieces are there, Lego bricks or whatever you want to call them, to build your own little kit of how to do this. Um, you call the Create Account API, you can call in an Assumer role. A lot of customers like yourself probably use CloudFormation and I could use a CloudFormation template to instantiate all the resources, everything that's needed in the account. I set it up, when I'm done, I move it to the OU that represents what this account is gonna be used for, maybe production, maybe it's a development. And once it's done, the user can now access, the end user can now access the account to do whatever they want. Big benefit is you can standardize, you can stamp out accounts that look pretty much the same every single time you need a new one. You can even go a step further than that. You might wanna think about potentially building your own portal internally. Portal page, you connect it to your favorite internal identity store and control access to the portal page with permissions. And anybody who has access to that portal page, they can create an account. So in the front end, you basically ask the basic questions. What is this account going to be used for? Dev, test, or prod? Right? Um, are you going to be using EC2? Are you going to be using this? Whatever the questions are you want to ask. And once they've answered the question, the back end, you, the service that you have or the server calls back in and creates the account for them, uses the information about what they wanted to use the account for, configures with CloudFormation, and then hands over the accounts to the user. Big benefit? The cloud admin team, the central ops team, doesn't have to lift a finger to create an account. You actually made it easy for them. And you actually set up the accounts that meets your standards of what you want it to be set up in the account. Right? I'm using CloudFormation example. You can use other tools as well. There are other tools that help with configuration. Whatever your favorite tool is that you can programmatically use, you can use that as well. Um, so this is one of those things where you can automate. Once again, it helps you. It takes human beings out of the picture. It's easier for your team to get up and running and get moving fast and, and getting things in play. And minimizing sitting have to wait or somebody clicking the wrong button or potentially configuring it the wrong way. The benefit of using a, a configuration tool is that you could also now use services that helps you keep the whole environment compliant. How many in here uses AWS config? How many, keep your hands up, how many uses AWS config rules? Small set. How many know what AWS config rules is? A little bit more so. How many had lunch? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just seeing if you're awake. Um, so AWS config and AWS config rules are ways for you to monitor and look at your account. And I'm gonna use the term account for now. Look at your account um, uh, if it's up, up to snuff of what you want it to be. Right. And you can use config rules as a mechanism of, oh, that value has been changed, or that thing has been changed to something that I don't recognize. I'm going to fire off a Lambda event, that go, fire off a Lambda function that goes in and fixes and move, moves it back. So in other words, you can configure things in your account. Part of the configuration could be I'm going to put in config, config rules that's going to help monitor and, and uh, within quotes, self-heal, I don't know a better term, but self-heal the account back to what you want it to be. And this is the benefit of also, as I said, building this workflow of getting accounts created. Once again, automation. You're taking a lot of work away from your admin team, having to sit and create the accounts and clicking and doing scripts. Automate it, give people that the power of creating their own accounts, but you still want to go and control what's in place. And this gets down to the same thing with CloudTrail. Set up CloudTrail, make sure it writes to a specific audit, uh, S3 bucket and some other accounts. I'm always where set all this stuff up so when they get the account, everything is configured and in place. Automate, automate, automate. Now, there are things that you're not going to be able to automate, uh, which means you might have to go and do things manual. Um, one of the things we are working on on our side in organizations is to get to the point that we can get rid of all those, I'll call them paper cuts, um, but you can get very, very far with what's there today. Um, and over time, we're going to add and start integrating a lot of these services that I've been talking on. Um, uh, our goal is to get them integrated into organizations so you don't have to build this workflow. It's more or less part of what organizations gives you. Um, but it's not, we're not there today, so what I described is something that you would have to go and configure and build yourself. So I put up audit here, and this is not so much like I go and look at the audit trail, so that's one piece. But um, one thing we try to instill as a best practice is it's all fine and dandy to go in and configure, but you always want to audit and monitor really what actually is going on in all the accounts. 
And it might be looking at CloudTrail, but it might also be that you want to use some of the security tools that we have. I know we've announced a number of them at the, the keynotes um, this, during this week. And see how you can leverage those as a way of monitoring, looking at what actually is going on. Um, and here, one of the best practices to think about, same thing here, instead of doing it from the master account, create a separate account. Create an account you call security or whatever name you want to give it. But have a separate security account from where you get access into the other accounts to monitor, see what is going on, what act from a security perspective, um, like as the firewall open, is it closed, run whatever tools you need in the background that you have as security tools to validate that all the security um, aspects are proper in that account. Um, and the audit piece is the same thing, just m having the ability to see who's done what. Um, that's why you always want to lock down root, never use root in any situation. You always want to use specific IAM users or federation so you can actually track who did what in the system. And this is the same thing here, config rules and, 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 um, um, uh, um, and, conf uh, and config helps you with some of the monitoring and auditing to understand like where are we really at, what are we doing, um, um, what's going on in the account, and also getting an indication of what things should be changed, what things should be going back. You can define your own config rules, and I know there's a lot of templates you can pick as well that helps you get started and moving along. So, um, Some customers also use CloudWatch events. I'll give an example. Um, we've seen some customers where they require, for instance, at that EC2 instances always need to be tagged when they are running in an account. It's so fairly difficult to actually get that enforced. So you actually, when somebody calls to run instance to make sure that actually is, has a tag on it. So what you could have is you build your own function, more of a reactive situation, where you have a CloudWatch events that fire when an EC2 instance gets started. It calls a Lambda function that goes and looks at the instance. If there's no tag on it or not any of the appropriate tags that should be there, it terminates the instance. Right? Or you could go and suspend it, whatever mechanism you want to use. But this is a fairly common pattern we've seen as well. And this is another thing you can put in your automation script when you're creating accounts to getting those things into place. One thing that I forgot to mention when we talked about the auto automation, um, uh, how many here knows about stack sets, cloud formation stack sets? Small set, okay. So cloud formation stack sets is, um, um, uh, was released in July this year and gives the ability of deploying cloud formation templates across a set of accounts. Um, it is not integrated with organizations yet. We are working actively with them to get that, that make that happen. Um, but the way it works is you specify a set of accounts either through account IDs or you, excuse me, or you can point at an OU and you'll get a snapshot of all the accounts that are in the OU in your organization. Um, so if you add an account into the at OU, it doesn't pick it up. It's like it takes a snapshot and then it's done. Um, so you select a set of accounts, you select what the cloud formation templates are you want to roll out, and you select the deployment strategy. So this actually helps you define how you want to roll it out across all of your accounts. So that's another mechanism for using and rolling out configurations and getting rules and all these pieces for monitoring and auditing um, and automation in place. Um, so it could be worth thinking of uh, looking at that as well as a mechanism to use in your tool arsenal. Tool arsenal. Um, gonna make sure that I said everything here first, so. Oh, bullet there as well. You should, when you create an account, um, create a security and an audit role in it. So you can give access to auditors. Um, make sure that audit role only has read only. Um, but for security um, access, you need to talk to your security team of what actually it is that role should be able to do. But distinguish them. Have one for security and one for audit um, as a way of being able to poke in, look at it, and do things. Um, and as I said, have a separate account from where you want to go and poke at these accounts and look at them from a security perspective. Um, so you separate that out of the master account, like trying to minimize the things that you do from the master account as much as possible, other than managing your organization, in a sense. Uh, yeah. Pick one. How many use service control policies, have deployed service control policies? Very small set of hands. So service control policies are, as I said, it's a policy that allows you to go in and configure and define which service APIs are accessible in an account. And it's down to the, 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 the level of like EC2 run instance or S3 uh, crate bucket, as I talked about previously. Now, if you look at a policy, the actual physical policy, what we call service control policy, you cannot distinguish it from an IAM policy. It will look exactly the same. And for all intents and purposes, it is an IAM policy. It just happens to be deployed at a different layer than putting it on an individual user. 
But you can't specify conditions and you cannot specify resources. Um, something we're looking for the future. But for now, it's down to the level of, uh, re of uh, service APIs. Now, given the structure of the functionality we have in the IAM policy, you can either whitelist or you can blacklist. So you can either go down the path of saying, here are all the list of all the APIs or all the services, whatever granularity you pick, that are the ones that are, that are allowed. And anything that's not on that list, I'm effectively going to block. The other approach is, I'm going to allow everything except for these three APIs. Maybe, no, using a bad example, but maybe I don't want anybody to call run instance. Allow star, deny, EC2, run instance. That's blacklisting. They have pros and cons for what they can do. The benefit of the whitelisting is that if you put that, you have full control over what actually gets used in the accounts. So whenever AWS, whenever we launch a new service, it's not accessible. You have to look, you want to look at it, you might want to approve it, and then you add it into the policy. So you're in control of what actually gets accessed in there. The tricky part with that is developers always want to use cool stuff, so now you've got a problem where you're, you're, you're little in the way of them getting access to pieces. The benefit of the blacklisting is whenever something new comes out, everybody has access to it. Um, it's easy, and you don't have to really worry about it. But if there's things coming out that you really would want to block, you have to, it's retroactive, you have to go and block it later on. Both work. What we've seen with customers about the ones that are using it is about 50-50, each, each way they go down. What we strongly encourage as the best practice is try to stick with one, because it can be very complicated trying to determine what the actual resultant permission on an individual is in an account if you use both blacklisting and whitelisting in the same organization. You can, we're not stopping you, but it's worth thinking through with the same thing here, use a strategy, think through what it is, what you want to try and accomplish and what you want to put into place. The other thing to think about is, and this is the same experience, uh, same best practice we give when we talk about IAM uh, pieces of, try to avoid putting policies directly on the entity, like the account or the user. Try to use the group concept. There usually always is another user that comes in that needs the same permission. Now, there's always usually some other account that you're going to create that's going to need the same permission as another one. So create an OU, put the account in the OU, and put the policy on the OU. Just a simple best practice to, to follow. Um, uh, when you're working in, the, in this environment. One thing I should manage as well that, um, to be aware of with service control policy, something that you can help you with if you're trying to, if you've got um, a regulatory compliance that are requirements for your accounts. So service control policy gives you the ability of at least putting some guardrails in place to help you keep it under control and keep the guardrails without knowing that nobody can step out of bounds inside the account. That's the whole beauty of service control policy. You define it centrally, doesn't matter what permissions an individual in the account has, it will be blocked. We even, service control policy also gets enforced on root. So it's first mechanism, first thing that we've actually um, uh, delivered that actually affects root as well. So if you say block access to EC, uh, EC2 run instance, it's gonna be blocked for root as well. There is no difference between the principles. Keep it simple. Um, the more accounts, if you have one account or two accounts, managing with individual users in the account, yeah, that's probably doable. It's sort of like, okay, it's a little bit of a pain. You start going beyond that, it's gonna start becoming difficult. And now you're probably gonna start building your own tools and you're gonna start trying to match so that it's the same user, and you're changing passwords. Um, good suggestion and good best practice is trying to avoid that and do federation as much as possible. Um, and set that up. All that support fins is, exists in an account. Today, you still have to federate into an account. You can't federate into an organization. You federate in on a per account basis. But you can configure it as well. And this is, once again, getting back to the automation process. If you go down the path of federation and you're using SAML, I'm using this as an example, um, you can configure the role um, with your SAML document through CloudFormation. And now you basically do this as part of the account creation. Once you're done, now p your users can federate into the account um, without anything additional that needs to happen. Right? So federation is a good strategy when you start getting into at least way beyond th three to four accounts. Um, the fewer accounts you have, it's sort of like works dealing with users and passwords, but it's always a struggle trying to figure out, like, well, okay, this user left, like, which account did he have access to? Where did the users exist? Unless you build your own infrastructure on top of it. 
So Federation is a good store to go with regardless if it's you're using just uh, standalone accounts um, or if in this case you're actually going down the path of using organizations as a way of managing your accounts. Um, with that said, I'm going to have Chris come up and talk about um, what they're doing with organizations at Capital One. So, Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, so my name is Chris Schultz. I work at Capital One. Um, so I just want to give you some background. I think when Anders and I first proposed this, you know, it's always great having these best practice uh, topics, but having it's kind of a rule or example to kind of mesh that all together might trigger some thoughts and how you guys proceed with this in your own environments. Um, Capital One's been around for 25 years. So we've got uh, seven very distinct divisions that are all going all in on the cloud. And they're very distinct cultures as well. We've got hundreds of AWS accounts now. I've got thousands of developers and production support people hitting our consoles or our APIs on a monthly basis. Those are unique visitors every month. Um, and we've got a wide variety of workloads in the cloud. We have our external web presence is now Amazon. We've got our core retail banking functions are there. Data analysts are doing machine learning and other types of data analytics in the cloud. Um, you know, we're shooting to be pretty much you know, no compute resources in our data centers very shortly. So that kind of gives you a little bit of idea of the scope that we're, that we're tackling. And you know, in the early days, when it was just IAM policies, it was kind of hard. You were managing IAM policies across all these different accounts, and it was, you know, organizations was a welcome relief when it came. So some of the challenges we've been facing is it seems like everybody wants an AWS account. When we started this journey, we thought we'd have maybe 20 accounts, and we would pile a bunch of resources in there, and people would be happy, they would get along, you know, they could work in the same sandbox. Well, they can't. So I think along the same line, Amazon started evolving their idea of what an account is, and is creating it more as a resource container, that hard boundary that Anders talked about. Because really, when you're inside an account, it's very hard to control who has access to what resources. It's very easy with IAM to slice, okay, what APIs are you allowed to use? But it's very hard to say, Developer A gets access to these things, and developer B gets access to these things, because it's all dynamic. You can't just name resources in a policy, because they may not exist yet. So we're using those accounts more and more as, a, as that authorization boundary. But that creates a mix. We now have some accounts that are very small, and some accounts that we remain are still very, very big. But there's some other challenges that we've had to face over the last couple of years. As we've gotten more comfortable with Amazon, uh, we're starting to move more sensitive workloads in the cloud, PCI data, for example, uh, you know, those that contain credit card information. Scoping that out is very important because you have these auditors that come in and want to audit your PCI stuff every year. And it's very important to define a boundary because that controls what they can audit. And there's costs associated with that. So we needed to come up with a system of record of how do we catalog what are our PCI systems and what are they... Um, what are they for? We also have some cost and complexity issues. Uh, historically, Capital One's IT budgets were just kind of evenly spread across all the divisions. So you had the little guys who didn't use much, but they got the big bill, and the big guys got an awesome deal because the other divisions were paying for it. With these accounts, we can now finally give us cost transparency and bill back directly to these users for what they use. It really makes them challenge how they're using resources. Um, and, you know, Anders talked briefly before, like, how do we tackle some odd behavior in our accounts? I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and how can we improve our access control policies? These are some of the challenges that we were facing that organizations are helping us solve. And finally, last but not least, as a bank, we deal with these individuals called auditors and regulators. They come knocking on your door and they want answers. And the simpler the story you can tell them, the better it is. And that's one of the things we've learned along the ways with uh, organizations that will be able to kind of improve that story. Because these are complex topics, especially in the banking industry. It's a new journey for a lot of these regulators in that they, they don't quite know how to approach the cloud. They don't quite know. They know data centers. This is one of those ways you can help describe um, your controls to them. So how does this benefit us? Um, we automate. So we're getting really close to being able to automate the complete account setup. 
And this has drastically reduced the amount of time it takes for us to create accounts. It's gone from weeks to days. It's still not perfect yet. There are still some minor hiccups that you have to pay attention to. Some minor things like uh, when you want to act, you have to activate your enterprise support policy in an account when you create it, then able to use certain service APIs if you don't put billing information in. So here's the irony is like, we're known for our credit cards. We don't put credit card numbers in our accounts when we create them. We need to attach it to our enterprise support agreement and then that enables us to use a lot more APIs. That's not quite there yet. So just be aware as you start this automation journey that could come up. But largely this has reduced our account creation time and allows us to organize our accounts into a, a meaningful structure. I'll show you a diagram here in a little bit. And I cannot stress this enough. If you have, if you're an organization, I mean, a company that has more than a handful of AWS accounts, uh, just being able to go and list all those accounts and what their current status are, that's a big win. We would have situations in the past where we would go and acquire a company that was already in Amazon and our finance guys would, oh, well, I need to link this new account into our master account so we can start paying for this newly acquired company. Us as engineers may not find out about it until much later. We actually had minor billing data for new account numbers before organizations came up. But now we can on demand list every account that we have and see what, what their status is. So that's been a big win as well. So again, it simplifies the listing and reporting of AWS accounts. So when you define your OU structure that Andrews was talking about, it also allows you to say, here are all the accounts that belong to division A, division B, and division C. So if you have more than a handful of those, it's, it's really helpful. Um, we found that the hierarchy implementation is very flexible. So we can even handle even divisional customizations. We haven't had anybody ask for that yet, but we're kind of planning ahead for that. And you'll see it when I show the diagram in a minute. Um, so we're also exploring ways to use organizations and the CloudWatch events that they trigger now in the master account to try to hook up some external tooling as well. So when Anders talks about automating the account creation, as you get more complex and you have more people coming in and you buy more software, you go out to the expo floor and you pick a handful of vendors that you want to partner with and they all want to tie into your accounts to graph your billing data or look at odd things in your accounts. You know, those create tie-ins to your accounts as well. So those are challenges as well to automating the account creation, getting those stood up as much as possible. So I think one of the things we can all do as customers of those vendors, or if we have any vendors in the room, is really push them as well to adopt this organization's API and as a way to kind of help integrate more quickly as you create accounts. And we're also looking at ways to identify where an account lands on the OU tree to drive some of our own automation and decisioning on how we behave in those accounts. So we use OUs to logically group and manage our accounts. It help, helps us to track our, track our account lifecycle. And we strongly leverage the account creation API. It saved us a, a lot of time. And we do, in a limited sense, use service control policies to provide a backstop on certain IAM actions. Because writing IAM policies can be hard. Um, we use a whitelist approach. We started out with a blacklist. That was the reinvent effect, I tell you. When you have a blacklist policy, just, just, just go home after reinvent because every developer is then trying to use every new service. And as a bank, we can't really allow that. So one of the early lessons we learned after I think our first reinvent was we need to flip this. And so now we're on a whitelist policy. But sometimes you mess those things up because they're not always easy. And you can also think of a service control policy as even though you might be controlling for something in your IAM policy on your roles or your users in your account, think about applying some deny actions in your SCPs to provide that backstop. And again, that gives you a better story to tell your security people or your regulators, no, I'm sure I don't allow this service that I don't want because here it is in my service control policy where there's a deny. Also, belts and suspenders, if you like that analogy. So finally, this is an example of what our org structure looks like. You can see that we have kind of an empty OU at the top. That allows us to create additional OUs off to the side. So if we, did, if we just hung right off the root, it would kind of be a little bit less flexible. So just kind of use that. And potentially, you know, if you have some SCPs that you need to apply organization-wide, it's a better place to put them there. Um, then 
I give you an example division here on, in the blue, but imagine that replicated out seven times. If we go down the blue, you can see we've chosen to go by environment. So uh, some of these acronyms, acronyms may not need, mean anything to you, but you have PCI, we have production QA and Dev. So we can actually isolate those or use. So I know now we call PCI CDE. Any account listed under there, if an auditor comes in, wants to audit our PCI accounts, they can say, well, okay, just you only get to look at these accounts under this OU. We have specific service control policies. We don't allow you know, services that Amazon hasn't approved for PCI use. We don't use that because we have to all be compliant as a whole. So we can deny those in the service control policies in that OU. And then finally, under each of those, you can see there's a purpose, that bottom blue row there. We have come up with some ideas like internal facing, customer facing, data analytics, and, and um, connect. So we announced you know, we're an early adopter of connect, but they're pretty specialized accounts. We only want to have connect things running in there. We can block things further that way as well. So that's kind of our basic structure. In an ideal world, that's all we would have. But we do things like acquisitions. So we actually have a holding OU just for acquisitions. And this allows us to bring new companies in that may already have an account. Maybe they're not fully compliant with our controls just yet because we have an onboarding process. We can park them there while we adapt them and then figure out where they need to land later on. And a lot of times there's some porting involved. There's some things that you, know, you might need to do to change. Sometimes they want to abandon the account and just go into a new account that we've built to our specifications so we can handle that. Uh, the little red box up there is an isolation area. Uh, we came up with this idea to so deny all as well that Anders mentioned in his, in, his, um, in his talk previously, but we were doing a tabletop exercise of how do we lock down an account if we think there's a breach. We haven't luckily had to use this yet, but when we saw SCPs, this was one of the first things that jumped to our minds is we could do a deny all, and if you see anything squirrely going on in your accounts, you quickly move it over, shut down your direct connects, and you can effectively isolate your accounts and block anything that's going on. So that's, that is one thing we've, we've kind of leave out there ready to go, but uh, knock on wood, we haven't had a need to use that yet. And then finally, just some other ideas that we came up with is we use uh, federated identity management. We really try to minimize the number of IM users we have. So we have, we run our own um, SAML identity provider. It's tied into our Active Directory, so I don't have to manage passwords and users or anything like that for those thousands of users that are coming into my accounts all the time. But as a, as a core engineering team, what happens if that breaks? So we do have an entry area that allows us to have IAM users, but we needed to really, really tightly control that. So we created its own OU, and we lock it down with service control policies so that the only thing anybody can do in there are IAM activities, and they're very, very specific. So you come in, and then you can fan out from there. One of the lessons we learned is we thought, well, we need to tightly secure this special account. We, went, we turned on CloudTrail, then we realized after turning it on, we could also put a service control policy to block CloudTrail after that. And that leads you down the path. Like, there, there are some things you never want to change in your account. You can prevent drift by selectively doing something in your service control policies. Just because you turn it off after the fact, after you've created your CloudTrail, you can turn it off in service control policy, but your CloudTrail will still function. No one can create any new ones. No one can delete the ones you have. It gives you a little bit of more control over maybe some of these things that you consider critical because you want to prever preserve that security data. So there's little things you can do along those lines. So as you're thinking about crafting your service control policies, you know, as you're, think about it in terms also of your account lifecycle. There might be things you do at account creation that you then never ever want to do again. So as you're building your accounts, set them up and then move them to the OU that then blocks the reversal of some of those configurations. It's another good way to control drift in your accounts. So some things to be aware of, um, you know, OU depth can exceed five levels. So you know, some people can kind of go a little crazy with creating these OUs. We try to minimize what they are because I think the other thing you need to kind of be aware of is uh, some of the early drafts that we have of what our OU structure looked like. I looked at them and realized, wow, there is one account per OU. This, I don't think this is the kind of scale we want because we don't want to manage 200 branches if we have 200 accounts. We'd much rather have better lumping better clumping, better efficiency of our tree. So just be aware of that as you're designing your OU tree. You know, worry about the depth, but
but don't go nuts to where every account is under a single OU. You're going to lose some efficiency down the road. It's okay to have one or two oddballs, but ideally you should be able to lump these things together. Uh, your organizational unit name must be unique within an org. So, you know, we wanted to replicate those divisions and we wanted to have similar environment names and then similar function names, and then we realized, eh, we can't have prod replicated in an OU multiple times. So you just have to come up with a naming convention that ensures that it's unique. Uh, you can't quite automate all the things yet. We t I talked about the support plan previously. Uh, you can't quite automate the root password yet, and you can't quite automate setting up the alternate email accounts. So just be aware of that as you're going through automation. Some of these might be more important for you than others. Um, I know some other customers of Amazon just ignore the whole alternate email thing, uh, but we go ahead and do it since we still have to set the support plan. And as mentioned previously about SCPs, they're the only type. And finally, this one's kind of funny. So we generally don't get to see the account name in our accounts because we use a federated provider. So if you go up where you normally might see the account name, you actually see our role that we're in and not the actual account. So account name is not the same as account alias. So we often refer to our accounts as our alias. And when the org API came out, I'm immediately going in there and doing list accounts and describing them and looking at them. And I'm looking at these account names and going, okay, there's a lot in here called Capital One. Uh, that's not what I'm used to. And then finally, there's like John Smith. So it was from an account acquisition we had. Somebody actually plugged their own name into the account name, but the alias was something that made sense. So as you start to really explore the org API, you can see some weirdness when it comes to how you may refer to your accounts may not actually be presented in the org's API, if this makes sense. So you don't see the alias, you just see the name. And so that might cause you some initial confusion, especially if you already have a huge like stable of accounts that you're used to seeing. So, I mean, in summary, if you cover some of our the best practices, you know, we, we try to plan out right now what, what people use accounts for and how they fall into these buckets of, of uh, these OUs. And we try to control exactly why people get accounts. You know, we go a long way in trying to secure everything. We use service control policies to lock down APIs that we don't want people to have access to, not just because we don't approve the service, but because we don't ever want them to do something again, like, you know, potentially deleting a cloud trail. Um, from a, a control perspective and a management perspective, we feel like orgs give us that system of record and also some additional ability to uh, get a better handle on how our accounts are growing because we don't think we're stopping at the couple hundred that we have now. We think we're gonna, next year, I'm kind of scared to think about how many accounts we might have. But from some of the other best practices, I think you know, orgs really enable a lot of those features. And I think we're really excited to see how these other services are gonna adopt service control policies so that going forward, we can more centrally manage things like S3 buckets and anything else that Amazon throws at us. So. Thank you, Chris. So quick summary. So Chris started off the summary. I really quickly want to go through what we talked about. So it's all the thing that we have at there. Plan, secure, control, manage, automate, audit, and pick one and keep it simple, right? If you follow these guidance and you think through what you're doing, and I the biggest one and the most important one is going to be the planning. Think through what you're going to do, what do you want to use accounts for and the structure. You're set up for a really great journey um, using organizations. And I said, we're going to be working hard to get all the other services to onboard so you can start managing all of these aspects centrally and, and faster move your business and grow your business on top of AWS. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.